We will call this regular meeting of the City Council of City of East Ridge, June 27, 2019, meeting to order. We'd like to invite Robert Jones forward for invocation and to lead us in our pledge. If everyone can stand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of the community. Fill us with your grace, Lord, as we make decisions that might affect our residents, our city staff, our counselors, and our mayor of this wonderful pioneer community we call East Ridge. Continue to remind us that all we do here today, all that we accomplish is for the pursuit of truth, for the great glory of you, and for you, the service of humanity. We ask these in your name. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. agenda. I assume everyone's had a chance to uh, read the uh, minutes of the June 13, 2019 agenda work session, the minutes of the June 13, 2019 regular council meeting, and the May 2019 financial report. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Make a motion to approve. We have a motion by Councilmember Chauncey and a second by Vice Mayor Helton. Do we have any discussion? Roll call, Ms. Milton. Vice Mayor Helton? Yes. Councilmember Cagle? Yes. Councilmember Chauncey? Yes. Councilmember Webb? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. Item 5 is communications from citizens. Uh, this is an opportunity for a uh, citizen, business owner within these streets to come forward uh, if they have any questions, any concerns to present to the council. I will say that we will have a public hearing for a couple of our zoning items uh, later, so let's reserve this for communication for citizens at this time. I currently have um, a list that's still out. Uh, Marilyn Hardley? Hadley. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, next, I have Jane Sharp. Thank you. James Ellis. Same thing. Okay. Thank you, sir. David Hill. I'm here about to rezone it to 3400 Rainbow Road. All right, 3,400. There'll be a public hearing for that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dale McQuarrie? Uh, yeah, Adam J. Adam J. Okay. All right. That's all I have on the list, but I'll entertain anyone from the audience if they'd like to come forward um, and address the council. Right, I see none. I'll move forward with communications from council members. Um, I'll show on this side. Vice Mayor Hilton? Uh, nothing at this time. Council Member Cagle? No. Council Member Chauncey? Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, during the break, Ms. Uh, Amanda Bowers had gone and 
looked up some details and ordinance about the questions that Councilmember Cagle had. And I was going to see if it's okay with you if you want to come out and just go over the answers to that. Sure. Yes, Mayor Council. When you were discussing regarding first the tires, uh, that is true. We do not pick up tires because there is a fee that the county charges. Now, on the Hamilton County's recycling section of their website, they have a location and the fees involved, which is actually at 7609 Stanford Gap Road, and you call 602-TIRE or 602-8473. They're open Monday through Thursday, 7.30 to 3.30, and the cost is a dollar per passenger tire and four dollars per truck tire, and you must call before to set up an appointment. Um, the only time that the city takes tires to that location or to a recycling location is during the uh, river rescue uh, because we do get um, basically a free pass at that point because it is part of the river rescue plan. Don't throw them in the creek. No, Spring Creek is not a drop location. Yes, no, that is not. I don't want to see any extra tires come fall. But um, no, so that's the location for that. And also, um, location for hazardous waste materials is located there. And I can put a link on our website and our sanitation page um, for citizens that can look that up. But we don't have the capabilities of doing that. And then, uh, as to the pickup of uh, things on multi dwellings or rental property, uh, we do have an ordinance on our website as well on sanitation. It's ordinance 1030, and part of that addresses it's 17 126 bulk item fee. And a fee will be assessed on a multi dwelling or rental property, um, depends on the time it takes for us to uh, get the items, uh, personnel, etc. And that's usually if it's a cleanup or a um, eviction. So if, it's, if you can tell that the home, the rental property has been cleaned out and basically the whole house sitting out in front of the curb, that's when a fee will be assessed. But if a renter is staying there and they have a couch or you know a table or something like that, that's a different story. Uh, but that is addressed in our ordinance. So um, Mr. Parker was correct in what he said. So we can rent the dumpster, uh, the landlord can rent the dumpster, pay for the rental on the dumpster. And, uh... Yes, they can do that. That's perfectly acceptable. And it also addresses uh, any of the hazardous waste materials and things that we do and do not clean up. But all of that's on our website if you go under the eastreachtn.gov, under government, under department, and then sanitation, and it's near the very top of the page. But I will go ahead and add the link to the Hamilton County's Recycling Center section for those that have um, hazardous waste like paints and chemicals and things like that, as well as the tire location. Thank you for doing that quickly. That's all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Wood. I don't have anything. I don't have anything either at this time. See you, Mayor. Okay. Um, just a couple quick things. Um, the Mayor and I went to the GPO meeting over this week. Uh, we had been to one today. That was my first. And so uh, it's good. We've uh, got to look at the uh, some of the priorities of the road projects around the county uh, and in North Georgia things going on so uh, you got to see where some of our projects are we have a few of them that are moving forward so I just want to mention the fact we went to that and that's that meeting is open to the public when it's down at the uh, development center so it's once every quarter the next one that we that's my one big thing um, one other thing I want to talk about real quick is we have two items that um, will not be uh, received and paid for during this fiscal year and what usually happens is is if we have an item that goes past uh, June 30th, and we haven't received it yet, then it doesn't get paid until the next fiscal year, because state law says basically on June 30th, if any, if any money's not spent, revert back to the general fund. Well, the two items that will not be here by end time are, number one, we have some SWAT rifles that I've been told were ordered back in August, um, and the rifles uh, we're gonna take over three months to get here. So that put the time in November, December time frame. And whether it's just, you know, and I wasn't here, so things that were going on in the police department at that time, whether it was just communication issues or whatever was going on at that point with the police chief, those rifles either were not checked on or the distributor either uh, dropped the ball on the order, we don't know. 
uh, that amounts uh, 35,281.25. Um, but they should be coming in hopefully in the next couple months. Okay. So the big ticket items we're trying to check on. The other item is the uh, tennis court. They're out there working on it, but it won't be done by June 30th uh, due to the rain and the weather issues we had, plus uh, where they put us in the list to, to get it done. They're actively working on it now. But with both of these items not being completed and or received by June 30th, we had, we had the items encumbered, but like I said, when it goes past that date, that encumbrance goes away and when it goes back to fund balance. What I want to do is when those items do come in and we're ready to pay for them this, uh, this fall or hopefully late summer, to bring an ordinance back to the council for those two items to document the fact that A, you all know we have received them because I understand the swap rifles were a very important purchase that we've been waiting on. Uh, so when both of those come in, we'll document the fact that we have received them and at that point ask to bring that money that just got pop, put into fund balance for those two items to revert it back to be able to pay for Anybody have any questions on that? that makes sense. Okay. So what was the amount for the tennis courts? Oh, 25 pounds. So a little over 60,000 will drop in the general fund. It'll stay there and then it'll have to do a budget amendment when we actually get the invoice. Business at May. Public hearing for the ordinance of number 1105. So, this is the fiscal year 2020 bud, budget ordinance. Um, as you know, we uh, presented this uh, just about a month ago. Um, we had our first reading two weeks ago. Um, we had one budget work session uh, to review the entire budget. Our general fund budget is thirteen million eight eighty two seven forty six. Um, the revenues and expenditures. Other funds are also listed in the ordinance. Economic development fund a million seven thirty two nine zero five. Uh, State Street eight a million eight twenty one eighty five. Grant fund three million two thirty two four sixty five. Solid waste, uh, 1,518,050. Drug fund, 65,000. Uh, drug forfeiture fund, or Department of Justice forfeiture fund. Um, that's usually uh, $2,240, but that deals with check charges, and that budget stays there until something happens. Capital projects fund, 1,208,341. Debt service, 1,189,012. And if you all remember, uh, this budget is, is balanced. We do have a use of fund balance of the 646000 not for operating costs, but to complete two capital projects that you all um, had approved earlier. And that deals with 500000 for the splash pad and 146000 for the multimodal project for our portion of that, correct? Yes. So that's what we stand. Oh, and the most important and thing, there is no tax. And those are reimbursed by the Board of Reading? Yes. That's coming out of the general fund. Correct. And then what was the last piece? Oh, no tax, no property tax increase. <laughs> okay, so I will open this public hearing to see uh, if we have anyone who likes any comments or questions from uh, citizens. Is there in the budget? I see none. I will close the public hearing and move it into item B, the actual ordinance. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of East Ridge, Tennessee, making and fixing the annual appropriations of the several departments of the city for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2019, and ending June 30, 2020. I won't repeat. repeat. Same old, same. Same old, same. So, do we have a, uh, a motion to approve Ordinance 1105 for the second final reading? Do you have a motion? Second. I have a motion from Vice Mayor Elton and a second from Council Member Witt. Do we have any discussion? I see none. Uh, 
Seeing none, roll call that Vice Mayor Hamilton? Yes. Council Member Cagle? Yes. Council Member Chauncey? Yes. Council Member Witt? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. Pass second final reading. Item C. An ordinance for the City Council of the City of East Ridge, Tennessee to provide for the general revenue thereof for the fiscal year 2019-2020 to be known as the general revenue ordinance for set year. And so basically this is our, our tax ordinance. Um, as we already said, the uh, property taxes are staying flat. We are not asking for any increase in the property tax this year and the rate is 1.338. Thank you again, sir. Do we have a motion to approve Ordinance 1106? Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion from uh, Vice Mayor Helton and a second from Council Member Witt. Do we have any discussion? Yes, I have one question. Yes, sir. We got a letter this week requesting from senior citizens that we would consider tax rates. Well, the way I understand that is when the reappraisal of our properties came up this year, but we chose to, instead of keeping our property tax, we chose to roll it back so it would not happen. So those people, the seniors that had that tax freeze at that time, what our tax rate was, what was it, dollar thirty-eight to dollar forty-two? It was one four. One forty-two. Well, then the seniors would have been frozen at 142. Am I understanding that right? Instead of rolling back to the. Well, first, we don't. You mean if we had a. If we had. If we had a. You know, it would have gone down because that was a reappraisal year. And state law says okay. during reappraisal year, we have to lower our rate in order to receive the same amount of revenue that we received the previous year. But we don't have to lower our rate. We don't have to lower the rate. We, just, we elected to lower the rate. Well, so you, have, well, you have to lower the rate. If you decide not to lower the rate, then it is a property tax increase. Correct. Once you have here, lower the rate of the county. County. And that's a property tax increase, which is advertised in the paper, and all the hearings and all that. Yes. And the seniors would have got the discount, actually, because of the building reappraisal here. Correct. There is also the property tax relief program that we're sharing with people as well. You can go to the county and or the state website and look up property tax relief. There's information on there to be able to apply for that program. Any other discussion? Roll call, Ms. Milton. Vice Mayor Helton? Yes. Council Member Cagle? Yes. Council Member Chauncey? Yes. Council Member Witt? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. Item up, oh, pass, second, follow reading. Item D? An ordinance of the City Council of the City of East Ridge, Tennessee, to amend ordinance number 1078 entitled, an ordinance to provide revenue for the City of East Ridge, Tennessee, for the fiscal year July 1, 2018 to June 30, 2019 appropriating the same to the payment of expenses of the municipal government, changing the revenues of the State Street Aid Fund, Grant Fund, Debt Service Fund, and by changing the expenditures of the General Fund, State Street Aid Fund, Grant Fund, Debt Service Fund, and Capital Improvement Fund. There were no changes between first and second reading. And no disasters, so there's no changes. Do we have a motion to approve Ordinance 1107? I make a motion to approve uh, Ordinance 1107. I'll second. We have a motion by Councilmember Witt and a second by Councilmember Chauncey. Do we have any discussion? <coughs> Roll call, Ms. Middleton. Vice Mayor Helton? Yes. Councilmember Cagle? Yes. Councilmember Chauncey? Yes. Councilmember Witt? Yes, Mayor Williams. Yes. Out of me. This is going to be the public hearing for ordinance number 1108. 
So um, this is the uh, rezoning for the tax amount for the proposed Red Bulls facility. Um, I'll open up this public hearing, and I'd first like to ask uh, Mr. Powell if he would come forward and provide us with the RPA um, recommendation and the results. Yes, Mayor and Council, this is case number 2019-0081 from RPA uh, Planning Commission to rezone 61.33 acres of the property uh, located at tax map 16E-B-008. Uh, RPA uh, staff recommendations, some of the uses may have potential uh, to produce nuisance on adjacent residential areas. Uh, large scale development would not be consistent with the ground surrounding development form. Uh, you also may have impacts on the floodway and stormwater, uh, possible building height and FAA regulations and light loops and village could uh, be affected. Thank you, sir. Next, I'm going to ask the applicant if they would like to come forward and address the council. Hello everybody, thanks for having us this evening. Um, I think you guys all know Jeff, and uh, from a technical standpoint, he can address, uh, you know, maybe some of the elements that were just pointed out of possible uh, issues related to flooding and, and how we plan on dealing with that. But um, we're real excited about uh, getting going on the project and, and appreciate your consideration. Thanks. This time I will uh, entertain. Is there anything else, sir? Oh, unless you have some questions. Yep, do you have any? No, I, I think we addressed the, uh, the last public hearing, so I'll wait to uh, we'll wait to hear what uh, comments the citizens have, and we can address them then if that's okay. Good. All right. So this is an opportunity for public hearing. Any uh, anyone would like to come forward that is for opposed or uh, for the, the rezoning? Oh, okay. This is Tyler? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hey. If you'll give us your name. Yes, I am Chrissy Champion. I'm the owner of Champion's Famous Front Chicken. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity to speak to you guys. Um, just like to start off by saying how super excited we are to come to the city of East Ridge. There's so much growth going on right now. I've never seen a city that is just on the edge of what you guys are. Um, to say that the Red Wolves were not, you know, a factor in our decision to come to East Ridge, you know, would just not be the truth. We were, whenever that was announced, East Ridge was always on our list, our very short list, to come um, here. When we heard that, it would just kind of push us right over the edge, and we, it was definitely a deciding factor in coming here. So we're in full support of it. Thank you. Thank you. And we're very excited to have champions in this very much so. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Marilyn Hadley, and I live at 6508 Holiday Drive, which is in Lansdale Park, uh, which is right behind, right in front of where this development is going to be. And so I'd like to express some concerns, the first being um, the ordinance that, well, the zoning application and now also the ordinance reads that it's rezoning the property located in the 6500 block of McCall Road. And then it has the tax and act number. And I know the, the, the with the application, the map that they sent kind of shows it behind the neighborhood. But uh, the 6500 block of McCall is actually the back street in our neighborhood. This is, this is McCall, and this whole section is the 6500 block of McCall. It's the back street of our neighborhood, and there's duplexes here. And part of the rezoning is for this strip of land that comes between these two duplexes that all, goes all the way to McCall Road. But um, our, my concern is that why the property address would be listed as 6500 McCall Road if it's, um, if it, you know, if it's not rezoning these duplexes. This is a picture of 6500 McCall Road. It's a, basically a three block long stretch. It goes from this white van here. You can see down to where I took taken the picture here. 
and it's got houses and duplexes on both sides of the street. So my concern is uh, with this is that this is a legal document, and if it's giving this address as the property address, I'm just wondering why. Um, if it's not really rezoning our duplexes and the, other, the homes on that street, that seems to me kind of ambiguous and confusing. And so it, it seems it's, an, it's an inaccurate and that it seems like the property zoning should be changed. And if it is zoning all these uh, duplexes and everything, then there should have been a zoning notice at that location, which there's not. So um, that's one thing I'd like to be addressed. It also lists on uh, page two of the zoning application under the property description, it lists as the access point to the property being available at McCall Road, Hurst Street, Sherwood Drive, Nottingham Drive, and Max Smith Road. And again, this is the area where, the, where it's going to be built with the streets around it. And Nottingham Drive and Sherwood Drive are both uh, dead end residential streets. And Hurst Street and McCall Street, again, that's in the back of our neighborhood. And if there's not going to be any impact on these residential neighborhoods, I'm not. I'm confused as to why these streets were listed as access points. Uh, are we going to have construction traffic coming through our neighborhoods? Even though at the beginning of, of my neighborhood, on both of the streets, Hearst and McCall, there are um, signs at the beginning of the neighborhood. Those are the two access points. The only two access points into our neighborhood. And there's signs. This is North Smith Road, which ends at McCall. You can see that same white van right there at the back. So the traffic would have to go all the way down North Smith Road to reach the access point that they're trying to rezone this little strip of land that goes that ends at McCall Road. So it's just to me, it seems kind of confusing. It feels like there's they're trying to create a back door for deliveries and things up and down North Smith Road, and that definitely impacts our neighborhood. And um, even though Planning Commission they said they weren't going to connect with our neighborhood. To me, these things are kind of confusing, and um, and because it's, it's listed that way, to me, if you if you pass the zoning, if you pass this application tonight as an ordinance, then it seems like by default you're kind of given permission for these access points into the property. And I, is that true? I don't know. So maybe someone can answer that for me at some point. Um, <laughs> Then I'd also like to um, refer to section 1402 of East Ridge's zoning requirements. In uh, the C4 zoning, it says it shall be permitted only where adequate frontage is available for ingress and egress, utilizing major streets as designated in the official general plan for East Ridge. And this rezoning request to C4 with plans to build a 5,500 seat outdoor stadium, a 375 room hotel, 400 residential units, and several retail and large commercial buildings with only these inferior access points given doesn't seem to meet the requirement established by our city zoning regulations. Since there's not adequate frontage currently available to get into and out of the property utilizing major streets, it seems like rezoning to C4 could not be approved until that happens. Um, I, I just don't know where there's going to be access in and out of this place during construction or after. It's not really been told, I mean, or indicated, if they're planning to connect the two pieces of Max Smith Road, it seems like maybe the zoning, our, our own zoning regulations would require that that be available already. Also, East Ridge's zoning regulations for a C4 planned commercial center are very specific as to exactly what uses are permitted, and they list approximately 50 different types of retail, residential, commercial establishments. Uh, that can be that are allowed and it goes on I mean department stores supermarkets drugstores bakeries meat markets delicatessen it goes on and on barbershops beauty shops eating and drinking establishments it, it's very very specific and it's, it allows theaters bowling alleys and other indoor entertainment and cultural facilities it doesn't say anything about an outdoor stadium being allowed and to me because it's so specific and because under Section 1405 prohibited uses and structures. It says in general any use or structure not of a nature or um, permitted under the principal uses uh, are prohibited. So uh, it just doesn't seem like it's, it's saying that you can have in C4 zoning you, you could have a um, outdoor stadium. So also in section 1409 of the regulations 
that cover the minimum off-street parking. These are East Ridge's zoning regulations, which you know, of course. Um, it says that the developer should must provide 563 parking spaces for the, for the hotel, 600 more parking spaces for the 400 residential units, and then another 1,834 parking spaces for a 5,500 seat stadium. So this has to be outdoor if the stadium is allowed to be built. This requires, so this is a total of 2,997 off-street parking spaces that also have to fit onto this property, not counting the additional parking spaces required for the retail establishments and the other, because there are, they go into that on square footage as well, but not counting those things, it's basically 3,000 off-street parking. Um, just with the off-street parking required for the residential units at the hotel, would add almost 1,200 automobiles in the area on a daily basis. In addition, the 1,000 people that are living there, working there, or staying at the hotel at any given time could be out for some fresh air and exercise and decide to walk through the connecting neighborhood where I live at Lansdale Park in order to access Ringgold Road and the different eating establishments, unless there's some guarantee that the developer will install adequate privacy fencing between that property and our neighborhood to prevent cut through traffic. And if the stadium were also allowed to be built uh, without some kind of privacy fence between it, um, the pedestrian traffic, to prevent the pedestrian traffic, we would also be overrun with people parking in our neighborhood and cutting through our neighborhood on foot to reach the stadium during events. My feeling is that a stadium that holds 5,500 people should be built at Camp Jordan along with the training center, that's why we have Camp Jordan, to handle large events with the traffic management and the security that they require, and to provide the much needed noise barrier between events and the residential neighborhoods of Eastridge. And they also, a couple of the local news articles said that the proposed stadium could also be used for concerts. The noise level produced, even just with soccer game, games, but I'm sure with concerts, is certainly something that probably none of you would want to live right next door to and um, also, the Camp Jordan area ha also has employees to clean up after events, but if people are cutting through our neighborhood before and after events, then I fear that the residents in my neighborhood would be the ones that would have to be cleaning up after these large crowds. And finally, according to section 1401 of the C4 zoning, of East Ridge and C4 zoning, the intent of the regulation is that the Planned Commerce Center should be complementary and appropriate to the surrounding neighborhood and that the development will protect and, and enhance the value of surrounding property in addition to fulfilling public needs for the, of the community or region. And even as the Planning Commission, the gentleman uh, spoke in the beginning and read their concerns about um, it being a nuisance to the neighbors with um, the noise and, I mean, he, they might be able to, to deal with the flooding. I'm concerned with a lot of the other things. I feel like this is the stadium itself is just is just really too big of a development to be put there. I mean, if they wanted to put the training center there and put the stadium across the interstate where they can handle that kind of traffic, that makes more sense to uh, me and some of my neighbors. So, I would appreciate that the uh, that this, that this council would take into consideration. Um, that the, the Hamilton County does have a C5 neighborhood commercial district zoning um, that is more, uh, more appropriate. It's intended for low to medium intensity commercial uses to promote, protect, and sustain the vitality of a neighborhood by allowing the development and maintenance of small commercial and service enterprises, which are both compatible with and complementary to residential properties within the immediate vicinity. It is intended that the uses in, in gen they generate smaller volumes of traffic, and that the business is located in a C5 neighborhood commercial district shall be for retail sales services and otherwise of such nature as to be a benefit or convenience to the majority of the residents. I realize that this avalanche is halfway down the mountain and there's probably no stopping it. And I appreciate the fact that I, I think the Red Bulls want to be good neighbors and I, I believe also that y'all are trying to do the best you can economically for East Ridge. But, um, I would just appreciate it if you could try to you know, mitigate as much as possible um, the impact that it has on the people that are going to be right next door. And that is us, the people of Lansdale Park. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate you.
Yes, ma'am. Is your name, please? Mr. Chauncey has already seen it, I think, from a, I handed this out at the planning uh, commission meeting as well. I'm Sandy Kurtz. I'm head of the uh, chairman of the South Chickamauga Creek Greenway Alliance. That is a citizen advocacy group that watches over the watershed since 1994 and, and um, tries to protect its, its aquatic species and water quality and the cultural amenities of the, of the area. Um, you, will, you will note on the handout that, um, that all of this wetland is, is, is um, in the flood zone or the flood plain. And um, because, because uh, it is in the floodway for most of it, then it's not appropriate it's not uh, permissible for any of uh, to be built built on, of course. And then the other part is the hundred-year floodplain and the and the uh, five hundred-year floodplain. All those surrounded by this by this neighborhood. If you will note on the other side of this handout, you will see that this uh, property card that was uh, pulled up says uh, down at the bottom the land is in the flood zone and is unbuildable. So I'm not quite sure why we have zoning at all, uh, but if it's unbuildable anyway, certainly um, it wouldn't be acceptable to be R1, which was what it started out to be, um, and now C, C3, C whatever zoning, if it's unbuildable, we don't need a zoning. We, it's just unbuildable. But uh, now we're talking about making it a, a, a C4 area. Um, the wetlands are, are crucial components for quality of life on Earth. And we need a healthy ecosystem, and and we're losing we're losing a lot of green space and a lot of wetlands. Um, this wetland should be preserved. It is a significant wetland. There was a in 2017 there was a biological assessment done by uh, this area by the North American Land Trust, and um, they say that there are several uh, critically uh, critically imperiled and or rare species living in this in this area. Some of it is um, the Chickamauga crayfish, you may have heard of that, but there are birds as well in that area and some plants that are that you probably never heard of, but they are uh, they are existing in wetlands and as we lose our wetlands we lose these these plants too. And um, so so it's in I think it's critical that we save this this uh, wetland area and uh, not try to build on it and, and des destroy it. Uh, in speaking with the Emergency Management Department of Hamilton County, those people, I learned that in between 1978 and 2018, there have been 504 losses in the East Ridge area due to flooding, and the losses amounted to $7,263,800. Those are insurance costs paid by the homeowners and, and um, not, not the homeowners and businesses and not the developer. That doesn't count the people who had, had no flood insurance. In fact, flood insurer companies may decide not to cover these people at all as the threat of flooding becomes more certain. And what is the cost to the city to send emergency management and hazardous waste mitigation staff to rescue people, as was done in 2009, where the people in the uh, senior cities, senior center and <clears throat> the hospital were, were evacuated in this area. So this, this enhanced soccer field development exacerbates those possibilities. Uh, Greg Helms, who heads up the emergency management department, pines that the storms are getting worse and of longer duration uh, given climate change trends. So taking away the wetland is, is a, a big problem. The incremental waivers and permits you are giving are taking away badly needed green space. It's like it's death like by a thousand cuts. So let this wetland do its work, provides free services, and um, I think that I would recommend that you 
delay the uh, changing of the zoning at this point until the engineers do their due diligence and figure out just just how they are going to uh, save this save the area and allow it to be the flood storage capacity that it provides now and um, and how they're going to keep that keep the flooding from happening in those neighborhoods um, this region already has a homegrown soccer team thank you Good evening. I'm Jane Sharp. I live at 6112 Schofield Avenue. I have a, a handout as well. I'm not going to read it word for word. I have extra copies for anyone who is interested. I'm here to express my concerns and also to express my endorsement for developments in East Ridge that will help renew our city. My family moved into Lansdale Park in 1953. We are the only owner of the house in which I currently reside. We have been through floods. There's another gentleman here who is a neighbor of ours and we waded through water in 1973. So we're well aware of the risks in that area. Lansdale Park is a family neighborhood of long standing, 66 years. We are to the point now where we are having young families with children move into the area. And my concern regarding access to this project through residential areas in Lansdale Park are pronounced. I would like to see that removed from the zoning application and a delay on approval until that can be done. I would also like to see as part of this process a 100 foot setback rather than a 25 foot setback for those people whose property is adjacent to this property so that we can maintain hardwood trees that have been growing now for 66 years. When we moved there, that area was completely clear cut. There was absolute expectation that additional development would be done in that area. And in 66 years, we've seen projects come and go and nothing has ever happened there. East Ridge, and yes, even Lancel Park would benefit from having an environmentally sound, neighborhood friendly, project in that area and that's what we want to see. We'd like to see permeable and pervious paving used in the parking area so that some of the stormwater can be returned to groundwater rather than being taxed with a stormwater runoff plan. Now let me get to the heart of it, Spring Creek Road. We have a two-lane road that's going to be strained, in fact is strained already, to handle the amount of traffic it is currently handling. Anyone who lives in Chattanooga knows that when traffic is backed up on I-75 or I-24 that you can get off of the freeway, come over to Ringgold Road or Spring Creek Road and get back onto the freeway and skip the bottleneck. Today, when I tried to make a left from Lansdale Park onto Spring Creek Road, there were 28 cars that were backed up trying to uh, wait for the light at Spring Creek Road and Ringo Road. This is what the situation is that we're dealing with now. When we have a stadium with 5,500 seats, which at a minimum is going to be several thousand vehicles coming into the area, we're going to create a risk for the ambulances that must have access to Park Ridge Hospital. Someone will die in an ambulance waiting for traffic. So I ask that that be a consideration as well. I realize it's not an effect of the zoning, but it's something that has got to be taken into consideration 
for the building of the stadium in that area. Also, there's been no mention of the fact that the area where the construction is going to take place is in a FEMA special flood hazard area, which increases the restrictions on the property and what can be done and cannot be done in terms of stormwater runoff and flood prevention. I've said all of that to say this. I feel very strongly that we can all be good neighbors, both the project and the people who live in the surrounding area, but we've got to have some input and I'm asking that you consider appointing a committee of five to seven people who are directly impacted by this who will address the concerns of the city of East Ridge, the developer and the owner of the property, and the residents that surround the property. So please take that into consideration as this project moves forward, as I'm sure it will, because we all want a better East Ridge. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another? Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Jack Moran, and this month we have lived in East Ridge for 47 years. And um, we won't have the same inconvenience as some of the people that's talked tonight. But if you drive I-24 and I-75, you're going to have inconvenience anyway until the project is finished. But it's called improvement. I'm focusing tonight in favor of the project. If you have to work around some issues, that's fine. But I don't want East Ridge to lose the opportunity to have the uh, income and the taxes from this uh, possibility. Uh, I don't live in that end of East Ridge. I live up in other end of East Ridge where there's more empty buildings than there are businesses. Where there used to be a Lovemans and a bakery and a toy store. Now there's check cashing and whatever, but there's not. I would love to have something like this at that end of East Ridge, and hopefully this year will increase that area. Uh, when people will try to get in to get close to this stadium, uh, I'll be 68 years old next week, and I would not mind living in walking distance of the stadium. I think that would be interesting. I don't think it's going to be an everyday issue because you have a season for the soccer, and uh, so it won't be every night every week but as a citizen of East Ridge I support this project and whatever you do and I, I support you all I think you'll do the right thing and I think you'll make the compromises that you need to make but whatever you do I, I plead that you don't lose this opportunity thank you, thank you. do we have anyone else My name is James Ellis. I live with Mary and <coughs> My family first moved up here in 1908. So, I mean, we've been down here a long time. And 21 since for the, the current presidents. My, uh, my concern is like some of these with the traffic, the congestion around the hospital. Uh, children uh, in that area, blood water. <coughs> I feel that it would be better, you know, if we could have it closer to Camp Jordan. Camp Jordan can handle the traffic. We've already got uh, Bass Pro down there. But, and I feel that tying up that street is going to be a real problem with saving lives and ambulances. Uh, and plus that, I checked, and, and that's going to, all that, the floodplain's going to have to be redone. And that is going to, possibly make people's flood insurance go up. I've already talked to uh, my insurance company and they've already told me that if you know, the floodplain changes, that that could possibly make my flood insurance, my homeowner's insurance go up 35 to $37 a month. And that's a, quite a bit of an increase of what I pay now. So 
we do need this. I've been out here a long time. I've been out here since the late 50s. So, I mean, we, we do need this. Our speedster is up, up close, like the gentleman was saying, we've got more buildings that are empty up toward the tunnels than we do that are being used. And, and I remember when that part of East Ridge was the better part, and now it's the lower part. So, so East Ridge does need this. If we don't get something, we're going to die. This community is going to die. So we do need something. But we need to look at the whole picture. So I just hope that y'all y'all did that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have another? <coughs> Anyone else? Mayor and Council, thank you. Uh, I, I've heard the concerns. A lot of the concerns were expressed at the, at the last meeting. Um, a, a lot of uh, what we've what we've heard uh, center around the uh, flooding issues, the traffic issues, the access issues, um, preservation. I think of wetlands will be one of the main things, um, and. I guess to address those first, what I can say is that we have regulations that we have to follow in the design of this project. We have permitting that is required. We have to uh, coordinate with the regulatory agencies, being the Corps of Engineers and the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. Um, what I can, I, I guess, disclose is that we, we recognize that this is a challenging site. Uh, we've gone through and, and we've looked at how we can reconfigure the site and do some things to, to preserve uh, some of the natural beauty of it, some of the timber that's on there, some of the wetlands that are on there. And, and we're, it, it's necessary for us to do that in order to get this site permitted. And it's the right thing to do. Uh, so I, I guess to address the flooding issues, the wetland issues, some of the environmental issues, um, we cannot turn water on uh, the, the residential neighborhood of Lansdale Park or any of the other ones. It's against the law for us to do that. If anything, we, we believe that uh, whenever we uh, construct the site, that we'll actually be able to improve some of the conditions uh, to allow the water to flow through. We've got a lot of work to do to uh, do the engineering and calculations and, and everything, but if anything, we think that we may improve that. Uh, when it comes to uh, responsible stewardship of the environment, uh, you know, we're going to need to do uh, and are looking to do green infrastructure. And, and by that, what I mean is, is we're looking to basically take the water, put it back into the ground, where it, uh, it basically takes out the, the pollutants from it and the thermal pollutants and able to send it through the site uh, to help us with our stormwater detention. Those are things that we feel that are going to be necessary to make the site work, and, and we're working around some of those issues. Um, one of the comments that, that was brought up early on is the rezoning of the R2 track that is at the 6500 block, I think of the call. Uh, and if you look closely at the zoning map, there is a slight, there's a slither uh, at that, that little point that is within the contiguous property, and that is R2. It's hard to see on the map, but there is a, a small slither of that, and that's why it's listed that way. We're not aware of any amendments to the rezoning uh, for those uh, uh, duplexes along the call or that, that block. It is uh, strictly that slither that, that comes out and touches the call. Um, one thing on that I can add, the property doesn't have an address on correct. the GIS. It's listed as just highway or, or Interstate 75 is what is listed. So um, when we constructed the caption, we just put 6500 McCall as that was the northern section. It is not any of the McCall properties. Um, and we can change the caption even just to say um, the property located at and have the tax map. I mean, it doesn't change it. So if there was any confusion, I apologize. It just doesn't have an address by the tax assessor's property. Right. I can see where the confusion came from. It's hard to see also on the map. Jim, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. 6500 there. I'll give you the access to Hearst. So you all have no plans on using Hearst as an 
acres for exit by getting this part of the I can answer that by saying I'm not sure which one is Hearst. So I mean North Smith, I'm sorry. North Smith. But that's more than sixty five hundred is. Because it goes straight off the Red Hill Road down right into the project. You got a piece of property. It's difficult for me for me to really answer that. I think that it is being assessed as to what is the least impact, what is the best route in, what has the right of way width to get into the property. I think that your primary access, especially with concern with the construction, is going to be on the North Smith that is uh, that ties into Spring Creek Road. Uh, so it is not the intent to have dump trucks coming North through. North Maxman. North Max Maxman, I apologize. Uh, so the intent is not to have dump trucks coming through the neighborhoods uh, to access the site. And I, I certainly understand the safety concerns with that. That's the biggest concern I've been hearing about, especially when you get this to 6,500. Okay. And, and part of what needs to be done with that, um, and I referred to this last time that you know we're really at step one of a hundred is, you know, a traffic study needs to be done to to determine what trip generations are made and what the impacts are going to be to Spring Creek Road um, and to the intersection there. And that traffic study needs to occur after Hamilton County Schools get back in session so that we can accurately uh, determine what the counts are with the school traffic generation as well. Um, so I anticipate that that will come up once the school gets back in session. Um, you know, the rezoning is necessary because if the rezoning does not occur, then the intended use uh, for the property cannot happen. Uh, and that's why I say that this is really step one of, of many steps that need to take place. And many, many regulatory bodies that need to be engaged for the site uh, and through the entire design process and the, the grading process. Is there any questions on those aspects? Yeah, I've got one more thing about that. Uh, on the other hand, in Hearst Street, the Hearst Street goes straight on through the, the houses that are there, too, going out into the property. So. That is, is that the one that is west of uh, north? Smith, uh, a few blocks over. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm familiar with that. Okay, so uh, that is, uh, like the lady was speaking on that a minute ago, because there and North Smith are the two main that uh, put you back there to that project. Yeah. Well, I think the neighbors are not wanting you all to use that because of the excess traffic and the foot traffic. that it is an ongoing um, assessment of, of the best access from, from that side. Um, but I, I guess what I can say is that I have not seen any plans for uh, the Hearst Street access either. And, and, and to say there's really no plan that exists, but you know I know that, that, that it is being looked at and, and, and looking, uh, looking at it from a, an, economic, or an economics perspective, but also an impact perspective. Uh, regarding cut through pedestrian traffic, um, part of the, the overall goal is to, to provide connection points um, through multi-use system. Basically, uh, we don't anticipate that uh, you're going to see traffic, especially with grade change, uh, traffic going from the site through Lansdale Park or any of the other neighborhoods. Uh, we, we don't anticipate that being a problem with that at all. Uh, there is a slight grade change that will occur uh, near the property boundary, um, and, and that's one of the challenges to the site. Uh, but we don't anticipate that that will be traversed by any pedestrians. There will be uh, paths specifically for access, uh, of, you know, to the destination points, and hopefully that they'll eventually tie into the multimodal system um, that is currently in design along Ringgold Road, and you know, with the hopes that eventually. Uh, half the residents of the city of East Ridge will be within a half mile walk uh, to a, a pretty nice network of, of greenway and, and multi systems.
we discussed um, uh, Mrs. Kurtz's concerns with wetlands. I understand that that you know it is a significant concern, um, and, and the best that I can offer right now is that we recognize that we have to work around those, and we recognize the importance of maintaining those wetlands. Uh, flooding, uh, it's going back to the same thing. We, we can't uh, turn water on people. We cannot adversely impact another project with our development. We recognize that. Um, as, as an engineering group and as planners, you know, we, we will follow the regulations uh, and won't be turning water onto folks. Uh, bear with me. Uh, pervious pavements is, is part of, of one of the concerns that, that came up. Um, and, and, you know, we haven't gotten far enough in the design for this, but pervious pavements serve the same purpose as green infrastructure. Um, our goal is, is to develop the site so it doesn't have a, a big giant stormwater pond on it like you see on typical sites. A site to navigate the site, uh, it's going to require, uh, whether we like it or not, it is going to require kind of uh, treatment facilities or treatment areas kind of throughout the site closer to where the raindrop falls, I, I guess is the best way to say that. Um, and, and part of the detention system is going to be what we anticipate will be a network of green infrastructure, whether that is pervious pavements or whether that is some kind of an infiltration system uh, in some of the parking lots or in some of the green spaces. Uh, we'll work that out as we go along, but we feel like that this is going to be a, a that, that we're going to achieve, achieve a lot of the uh, intended uh, or, or the, the elements of what pervious pavement system would be. Traffic on Spring Creek Road, I, I think I addressed that by basically stating that a traffic study is going to be done to determine um, basically the capacity for Spring Creek Road. We've had conversations with the Tennessee Department of Transportation. We're going to be sharing those, that traffic data with TDOT once they 2000, once we get to the June of 2021 and the intersection or the interchange project is done. TDOT has plans to move down I-24, replacing some of the bridges and making modifications there, from what I understand. Uh, and we've been in touch with the, the regional office and are going to share that data so that in their design process, they can accommodate some of the, the peak, peak ins and outs of that traffic as well in their design. Jeff, if you would, when you mentioned TDOT and yes. reconfiguration, I believe you've actually uh, have reached out to TDOT and talking about a walk path underneath 75. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because that would also give a walk path from Camp Jordan, possibly some access parking in Camp Jordan, and be able to walk into this facility. Yes, sir. And this dates back a couple of years. Um, when we were working on the design for the I 75 uh, exit one interchange, we had had some discussions with TDOT um, um, about a connection. We've had several grants that the city had received and were in the process of, uh, of planning for, for multimodal connectivity from the Bachman Tunnel basically all the way down to the Georgia State Line that would access uh, Camp Jordan and basically make that connection for both bicycles, pedestrians, ADA, ProAg, uh, uh, which is an ADA um, uh, basically crossing. And we had discussions with them about two years ago and asked them to include a, a safer way to get across I-75 on Ringgold Road. Um, at the time, they indicated that it would not be a part of their project, but that it's something that we can go after a grant for or some kind of feature. Um, we then went back to them when we, you know, this I-75 project came up and said, look, I understand you can't do Ringgold Road at this point, but um, why can't we make a connection basically with a greenway system and then go up under the proposed Spring Creek bridges? Uh, we started that discussion about two months ago. Hasn't yielded a lot of headway yet, uh, but we're still pushing. We feel like right now there is not a bike, pedestrian, or ADA accessible uh, uh, accessibility from the west side of East Ridge to the east side of the East Ridge. Uh, and specifically getting to Camp Jordan uh, Park. Additionally, um, you have 12 miles approximately of South Chickamauga Creek Greenway that stretches from the Tennessee Riverwalk system all the way down to Camp Jordan. 
and this could be a connection or an extension of that trail up under the interstate and then eventually tie into the multimodal facilities along Ringgold Road. And that's what I was alluding to earlier that, you know, it's possible that within a five-year period, if we can get TDOT on board, if we, if we can make things happen, that half of the East Ridge residents will have access to a 10 to 12 foot wide multi-use trail that they can bike and walk, ADA accessible all the way for basically 19 miles to get to the river walk and then another 10 mile, miles of river walk that takes it into St. Helena, which is an incredible opportunity. So we're working uh, and having discussions with TDOT and garnering support. Um, I, I can say that the Lindhurst Foundation is very excited about this and supportive of it. Uh, and they've even indicated that they would be open to us submitting a proposal to them for um, funding assistance for the stretch that would go from Camp Jordan to basically the I 75 bridges, provided TDOT gives us the access. Uh, in addition, the Benwood Foundation is supportive of uh, the Tennessee chapter of the Trust for Public Land, which has been instrumental in getting that 12 mile section of the South Chickamauga Creek Greenway. Uh, in is very supportive of it, and we continue to talk to advocacy groups and, and other groups about how important this connection is for wellness, quality of life, and simply giving folks a, a place to go to get off of the road and be able to navigate you know, some of the amenities and trail systems that Hamilton County has offered. Sorry if I drove that out too long. It's also already a precedent for that, though, right? Because South Chickamauga Greenway goes under 75 from the west part where it goes down towards Camp. There is um, one of um, TDOT's, you know, when we had discussions with TDOT, one of their uh, concerns was, is, you know, they're more concerned with interstate commerce with the interstate system. If it were an off interstate system, typically they would include um, sidewalks and such. Uh, but we did point out that, you know, right around the corner, uh, so I think within the same project limits of the interchange, you have uh, the Brainerd Golf Course that has a golf cart path, you know, to, if you want to play, but then on the other side, that's part of the South Chickamauga Creek Greenway that goes under uh, I-75 right there, less than, I would say, less than half a mile away from where we're, we're requesting this, this path. I think those were the primary concerns that I heard uh, during this meeting. Um, I did hear some concerns with, with noise. Um, We're working through that. Uh, I guess the best I can say, it'll be part of that, but we do recognize that, that we have requirements that we have for the, you know, the, the commercial retail hotels um, for the stadium, and it is something that will be required to meet those or to navigate those um, you know, without getting too far into it. There's going to be peak times for certain venues, and then you know, peak times are times when restaurants are open or uh, other areas office may be open, and there may be and the ability to share that, uh, I guess, is the best way I can say it. But we recognize that that parking is something that we have to have. So, so there, there is a buffer um, that, that is required to be maintained around the site where we fully recognize that. There will be some great differences, and I'm not an acoustics engineer, um, but there will be an elevation change between where the stadium sits, the foundation of the stadium, and where the residential structures, the, the foundations and the roofs of those are. I think most of Lansdale Park is all single story residential. Um, I, it's difficult for me to say what impact that has, but there will be a, a reduction or there will be a, a buffer between the landscape and also the elevation difference. Uh, and, and so that, that's about the best I can answer that. But it, it is something that as the site comes together, as we figure out the elevations, uh, as we figure out how all of this comes together, that will be taken into account. Any other questions? Any other questions? Council? Thank you, sir. I will close this public hearing. Then we'll move into item E.
that it's going to reduce the noise? Is that, is that what you're saying? Sir, I already closed the public hearing. If it can be brief, but we've already closed the public hearing. But I think he did say that there was going to be elevation and there was going to be some buffering. If you want to talk a little brief, but we have closed the public hearing, so I can't take any more questions. The intent would be to, to have a buffer in there, and there would be an elevation difference uh, where the stadium elevation is uh, versus where the, the residential neighborhood elevation is. Ordinance number 1108, an ordinance of the City Council in the City of East Ridge, Tennessee, to amend the zoning regulations and the zoning map of the City of East Ridge, Tennessee, so as to rezone the property located in the 6500 block of McCall Road, a tax map number 169E D 008, from C2 Commercial District, O2 Office District, and R1 Residential District to C4 Planned Commerce Center District. We entertain a motion if someone's going to make a motion for ordinance number 1108. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Hilton. We have a second by Council Member Witt. Do we have any discussion? I'd like to say that the discussion. 
Roll call, Ms. Middleton. Vice Mayor Halpin. Yes. Council Member Cagle. Yes. Council Member Chauncey. Yes. Council Member Witt. Yes. Mayor Wiggins. Yes. Item C. This is the public hearing for ordinance number 1110. This is the rezoning of the 3400 Ringgold Road, C2 Commercial District, the RZ10 Lot Line Residential District, and RT1 Residential Town Health District. I'll open this public hearing for ordinance 1110. Mr. Howell, you visit the description. Yes, once again, Mayor and Council, this is case number 2019-0053 from RPA Planning Commission to rezone the 3400 Ringgold Road from C2 to RZ1 and RT1. Uh, this will add zero lot line homes and townhomes to the rear of the property. Uh, the only concern with the RPA was the increased traffic and possible stormwater runoff. This is also approved by the Planning Commission. Thank you, sir. Do we have one that anyone here that would like to come forward and support or in opposition for yes. um, this home? Yes, sir. Superintendent at Mount Olivet Cemetery. We are uh, directly across Ringgold Road from the from this uh, address that you're proposing to rezone. We've had uh, tremendous flooding problems there uh, from stormwater runoff right at the intersection of Ringgold Road with Donaldson Road, and uh, also is a is a traffic problem entering Ringgold Road from Donaldson Road uh, in the morning from 7:30 until about. 10 o'clock and in the afternoon from 4 30 until 6. It is uh, very, very troublesome to get on the Ringo Road there. And adding this development uh, in that area, I think, would only increase that problem. Um, as was alluded to earlier in the, in the case of the rezoning of the property down on the uh, eastern end of East Ridge, uh, it was mentioned that, that the western end of East Ridge has remained stagnant for many, many years. And I think, I think you've got your hands on a, a real uh, gem of a development that could be potentially put in there. And, and I would hate to see you ruin that chance by putting in a quick development there that could eventually cause the city problems. Uh, we are totally against a, a residential development across from uh, our cemetery that currently is home to uh, 7,500 residents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have anyone else? I see none. I will close this public hearing and move into item D. Ordinance number 1110, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of East Ridge, Tennessee, to amend the zoning regulations and the zoning map of the City of East Ridge, Tennessee, so as to rezone the property located at 3400 Ringo Road, tax map number 168D-C-203, C2 Commercial District, RZ1, Zero Lot Line Residential District, and RT1 Residential Townhouse District. We entertain a motion for ordinance 1110. Motion to approve. Do I have a second? <laughs> we have a, a motion from Council Member Chauncey and a second from Vice Mayor Hilton. Do we have any discussion? Yes, sir. I wonder if we could do a road count there and see what the feasibility of the red light would be there. Do we have any
regards to the gentleman's concerns about the flood, I believe we're good. A streetscape project that's going to be coming up through there eventually. It's going to be going to have some infrastructure that's going to be coming through that area that will alleviate help with the uh, the flooding. Is that correct? That is correct. correct. That is absolutely correct. Do we have any other questions? I have one. Um, do we know, and this may be for Mr. Hall, do we know that is he going to, is this entrance and exit, is it going to be utilized through Blackhawk? Is it going to be directly out on Durango Road? Or is it going to be at the intersection there, Blackhawk or Donaldson, or do you know at this time? We do have the applicants here tonight, sir. Joseph, you want to address that?
with Cigna for health insurance coverage for employees of the City of East Ridge. <coughs> As we talked about before, they had a 6% increase to our current plan, which is a very good renewal rate considering we had the high claims. The trend is typically approximately 15%. So if we can get it at 6%, we think this is a good move for the employees in the city as well. That way it eliminates any problems when you have existing claims that are out there. If you're changing different companies, this would be a smooth transition for all. Thank you, ma'am. I'll entertain a motion for resolution 2952. I make a motion to approve 2952. Yes, sir. We have a motion from Councilmember Witt and a second from Councilmember Chauncey. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Yes. This is just for the insurance we've got right now. This has nothing to do with that insurance that the retirement the plan or anything that has to do with continuing what we the coverage we have now. Same provider, same coverage. Yeah. Any other questions? We'll call Ms. Milton. Vice Mayor Helton? Yes. Council Member Cagle? Yes. Council Member Chauncey? Yes. Council Member Webb? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. Adam G. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Eastridge, Tennessee, approving the application for and acceptance of the fiscal year 2020 Tennessee Department of Transportation's Multimodal Access Grant. Ms. Yes, Mayor Council. There we go. Yes, Mayor Council. This is the application that we have put in for in the past. This would extend our multimodal uh, project that we have going on so far would go from <coughs> Bryan Road East to about Swope Drive. Um, this is a wonderful grant because it's very hard to get. It's very competitive because it's a 95-5% match, which means for the million dollar project, the city would only have to contribute $50,000. I understand a motion for resolution 2953. I'll make a motion to approve. Do you have a second? I'll second. We have a motion to approve by Vice Mayor Yelton and a second by Council Member Chauncey. Do you have any discussion? Roll call Ms. Milton. Vice Mayor Helton? Yes. Council Member Cagle? Yes. Council Member Chauncey? Yes. Council Member Witt? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. Item H. Resolution number 2954, a resolution of City Council of the City of East Ridge, Tennessee, to approve the attached letter of intent with Great Southern Recreation with regards to the local parks and recreation fund grant. Ms. Bowers? Yes, Mayor Council. Um, this is part of the OPRF, the local parks and recreation fund, that's going to be doing Cranier Frontier Park and the splash pad. Um, we are asking to enter into this agreement. Uh, it's not going ahead and purchasing anything or doing a purchase order. It's just simply holding the price of the splash pad equipment. This has nothing to do with any of the equipment for the playground, but due to some tariffs and increases in their prices, um, they said that they would go ahead and honor the previous prices prior to the increase. Um, which is significant, it's almost $20,000 that we can save if we go ahead and do this letter of intent now. And so hold those prices once we're ready to purchase the equipment. Thank you, ma'am. I'll entertain a motion for resolution 2954. I'll make a motion to approve 2954. Second. I have a motion from, to approve by Councilmember Witt and a second from Councilmember Chauncey. Do we have any discussion? Roll call, Ms. Middleton. Yes. Mayor Helton. Yes. Council Member Cagle. Yes. Council Member Chauncey. Yes. Council Member Witt. Yes. Mayor Williams. 
Yes. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Item I. Resolution number 2955, a resolution excluding and inclusion or excluding an inclusion of certain properties within the certified border region retail tourism development district in accordance with public chapter 390 of the 2019 acts of the Tennessee General Assembly. Mayor, Mayor Council, uh, in mid, as we review the legislative actions of each year, those we generally get an uh, big influx of information in the beginning of June as to what the new laws are and um, in looking through this and in consultation with Representative Helton it was brought to our attention that there's an opportunity for this body to essentially modify the border region district if you so chose to. Um, the bad part is it has to be done by June 30th of this year so in a couple days it sunsets already there's probably even some question as to, um, essentially, the, there was always a provision in the statute that allowed for modification or at least exclusion of properties. In 2015, this body took advantage of that and did, in fact, exclude properties under Resolution 2491, 2492, and 2493, I believe. And so, in fact, this body probably um, <laughs> excluded somewhere around 20 properties. The reason around 20 properties were excluded at that time was from a mathematical standpoint when this uh, border region district was certified it immediately locked in a tax base, a 2012 tax base <coughs> whatever that number is, we don't necessarily get to know that the Department of Revenue, the Commissioner knows it but for mathematical purposes just assume it was a 10 million dollar tax um, base in 2012 all the properties making up the border region in 2012 are what consisted of making that tax base and in my example I'm giving you now is say 10 million. What's happened is the legislator recognizes that businesses have closed over time, not just here. This legislation was essentially passed for the tri-cities that have the border region uh, district. We just have an opportunity to perhaps take advantage because over the last two weeks, we've really explored and looked with the Director of Finance and talked to planning commissioners as well as representatives of the state as to what properties that were generating in um, sales tax may no longer be generating sales tax. And the reason that's important is, as I gave my example, if there's a $10 million floor as the uh, base sales tax, <coughs> Some properties that made up that 10 million are no longer operating, but this city still has to make up it to that 10 million before you ever see a dollar under the border region. So you now have an opportunity to perhaps exclude properties, in other words, lower that tax base, and you also have an opportunity to include properties, which some properties may have a zero tax base, and in which case you don't raise the tax base. Because the only point of the border region is you're going to get the first dollar of the border region when you exceed that tax base. And so going back to my example, if the tax base in 2012 was 10 million, then if you can pull out a piece of property, which just by example, one was suggested, the Kingwood Pharmacy. Um, we know, all we know is that sometime in 2012, Kingwood had sales tax somewhere between 50 and 60,000. We don't know the exact number, but we know that was their sales tax, which means they're generating they could be generating somewhere in the neighborhood of around probably close to $750,000 in sales. That's no longer in business. And so, as I told you, that $10 million sales that you're set at still has captured that Kingwood Pharmacy that's no longer in business. So you would do yourselves a favor by removing that Kingwood Pharmacy if you felt it's never going to, within the next, we've got seven years left in the border region, if you don't think it's going to be developed, you would pull it out. So you've kind of got a little bit of a gamble, but you only have until June 3030 to make a decision, unfortunately. So this came upon us very, very fast. Um, also, if I could real quick on that point, let me interrupt you. On the Kingwood Pharmacy, if it was redeveloped, they would have to meet a you know, higher standard or threshold. That's right. In order to start capturing dollars because there was that sales tax. That's right. That's a good point. So, yeah. The baseline. The baseline. Yeah. Right, so the Kingwood we know, let's just say 50,000 for easy math, 
uh, that's somewhere around 700,000 in sales. Whatever goes in there has does not see the first Puerto Rican dollar until it reaches 700,001 dollars. And so that's that's, and I have no idea if something's going to go in there, but that's the difficulty. Um, that pharmacy at the time, I think, was a pretty thriving, selling a lot of medicine, which had sales tax added to it. So um, you've got the Rite Aid building that is now uh, dormant, and uh, it had somewhere around. 25 to 35,000 in sales, and so that equate sales tax, excuse me. So you figure out what the state portion of that, and you get around 440,000 in sales occurring there. Um, by way of example, back in 2015, when the city excluded properties, one of the properties excluded was the bowling alley, and the bowling alley um, had about 33,000 in sales tax, and um, the Magoos had about 9,000, uh, give or take, 9 to 11,000 in sales tax. So um, those were taken out. So where you're sitting at now is you have an opportunity to exclude properties, you have an opportunity to include properties. The only caveat, you can't, ex can't include more than you've excluded. Um, some may argue that you've already excluded properties in 2015. I read the statute with the amendments that you actually have a right to exclude more properties. But even if you don't, you've already excluded probably close to, do you remember, Ms. Qualls, how many acres were, were excluded? I mean, it was close to 30 properties. So you know, even if you took half acre each, that, that 15 acres there. Um, but one of which was the bowling alley, which we know was four. Um, also, if you look at uh, where the food line sits, across the Kingwood, that one was excluded. It's not in it. That's right. That's right. It so that's a large. large. It is. So, Most of that size. That's right. So my point is, if the state takes the position that you don't have the right to exclude now, you've already excluded in 2015. You've got a bank of, of acres that you can now pull from to include the properties today because of the statute of what it's written. Um, and talking to Mark Mamitaw, I've talked to him several times, and he firmly believes you have a right to include properties. And so, for example, one of the properties I, I would highly recommend is where you've got exit one, um, the new interchange. You used to have a clover leaf there. That is now no longer a clover leaf. The city could capture that, that property. If it doesn't the border region, the city would have that property and it would be a significant more valuable piece of property uh, to sell um, than if it was not in the border region. And there was zero base lines. And it's zero, zero base tax because it's a TDOT property. It's not being sales on it. So that would be one that you might want to consider to look at. And so as I was working with the, the state and, and Ms. Qualls and talking with the Planning Commission trying to identify <coughs> properties, um, I came up with a list, and you all can reject any of these, but I've, I've provided to them as Exhibit A and Exhibit B to the resolution. And um, the um, Mr. Custer came up with, uh, there's, there's actually city-owned property that's in the floodway that's about 30 acres, and if you take out that 30 acres, that's giving you 30 more acres to work with if you wanted to include it. So Mr. Custer recommended let's take out the, it's located off the Spring Creek Road at tax map number 169C-C-001. That's the one down behind the hospital. I believe this one is kind of behind the school, I believe. It's on the east side, of, let me make sure I have it. I have it on the east side of
Um, you, can, you can reject those, do as you please, but these are the ones that we identified that were operating in 2012 that are no longer operating that perhaps might be a benefit to, to remove from the board of region because it lowers that threshold that the city has to meet in order to generate board of region dollars. Um, I then included for you in an Exhibit B a suggestion of properties to include and the, um, it's my understanding that there has been some interest in the bowling alley property and in talking with members of the planning commission uh, they've indicated that they've been approached they think there's a chance they don't know they thought there might be a chance that perhaps a particular retailer might come into that I mean, it's four acres it's, it's right on Ringo Road and it's currently out of the border region and so it was suggested that maybe that's a property to consider to put back into the border region and again that's about four acres um, it would consist of magoos. Um, that is actually by the, by the border region. And looking at it, a little bit of the magoos, actually, um, a portion of the magoos is actually in the border. I thought magoos was already yeah. in Yeah, and so it's, um, if you're looking at it right here, it's actually, it pretty much is in it.
So if they decide they're not going to use it, which is probably pretty likely since they just spent you know, money reconfiguring it, you've now got a property that's right off the interstate and um, it would have a zero tax basis and the city could then either they don't even have a valuable asset there to do what it chooses to with. Uh, I heard an update on that is that we cannot probably expect that until after the reconfiguration is done. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So it's not anything in the near future, at least what, 2021? Perhaps. When we get 2475 or Right. And it has zero tax base, so you're not adding. So I guess the, the net is 90,000 you're taking out, you're adding in 35, um, they're a net of 65. The net is what you're reducing it, if you accept it as this. I think the question really is is this body think that there's a chance that Kingwood or the um, Rite Aid might trigger? might eventually have something that would exceed the current tax base. And alternatively, the properties that you're bringing in, which is really just the bowling alley, does the bowling alley have the potential to bring in um, a retailer that would exceed sales tax in the amount of $35,000? dollars you a while back, didn't we approve rezoning the house behind it by someone was looking at
And that's why you're down here for Edwin Fox. Right, yeah, all of these yes. works. And this, this took, so we'll get the exact I was struggling for two weeks to get this information once, um, you know, I got information and, and um, that the actual legislation had been modified. We don't get an itemized We do. We do get an itemized list. Someone does. Someone does. If they are sworn to see. They are sworn to sign an act. They have to sign a confidentiality with the state of Tennessee. So, Governor, you're saying you're not at liberty to tell us. That's right. Okay. I can't even see. We don't have a motion on the floor that we're going to have a discussion. So, uh, is there? I'll go ahead and continue. Is there any more discussion? I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> discussion on this council. I've got another question. Are we voting on particular properties tonight, or just the ability to do? Well, unfortunately, January 30th, 2019, is the deadline, so it has to have the resolution certified. Um, that was in specifically in the statute. So the short answer is you'd have to identify we'll, whether or not you can exclude and include in what properties. We'll lose the opportunity if we don't make a decision. And as, as you know, Mr. Leacher noted, we could amend these exclusions and insertions if we wanted to. You, yeah, you, you're not set on, you're so not locked These are their recommendations. And, and in my discussion with some of the delegates that came up with this and then Representative Hilton made up, this was sort of a Tri-City type of amendment that was really slid in at the last second. Um, I'm not even certain Representative Hilton got notice of it until it was done. And of course, I was talking with her. She said, "We need to, you know, we need to look and see if there's any way the city can benefit from this." And so she had got in touch with me as soon as she could. And when we started looking at it, and it was a Tri-City type because Johnson City has a new board of retail district. They call it not board of region. Um, but this is really to help out the Tri Cities. We're just trying to say, hey, wait a second, we want to buy it down too, right. if it's beneficial to us. I knew this bill was out there, but like, like this hell, I didn't know that it got passed so quickly. Right. No other discussion. I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Um, let me ask the clarification a uh, motion to approve. With exhibit A and B as is. With exhibit A and B as is. Do I have a second? I second. I may have a motion from to approve resolution 2955 with exhibit A and B as is from Councilmember Chauncey and a second from Councilmember Whit. Any other discussion? Roll we'll call Ms. Milton. Vice Mayor Helton. Yes. Council Member Cagle. Yes. Council Member Chauncey. Yes. Council Member Webb. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. I hate to do this, but I'm going to pause and do a quick report. Mr. Lichford, he's head back, Sir Jones, if you might know this, give him a moment to stretch. Um, five minutes, and then we'll resume back and we'll then conclude with items J, K, and L. So we'll pause just for a minute. All right, we're going to resume so we don't stay here all night. I've been asked to move item K, which was A from the work agenda, and L, which was B from the work agenda, up. They should go relatively quick, quick and then we can uh, have time for the uh, we'll have time for the appeal right afterwards. So we'll do item A, which was K, which is item A from the work session. Resolution number two nine five six, a resolution of the city council of the city of East Ridge, Tennessee. Authorizing the mayor or his designee to enter into agreements with East Ridge Fast Loop and East Ridge Auto Electric for fleet maintenance and repair services for the city's fleet of vehicles. Yes, Mayor Council, as I stated earlier, 
we, uh, we propose to use one vendor for our repairs anymore rather than going month to month to different shops, getting different markups on parts, getting different labor rates, and then having to track down somebody that's made a repair that now needs to be redone. Uh, so we did a request for a proposal. It was sent out. We received five proposals back. Uh, the first one we looked at was uh, from Mountain View Ford. Their labor rates were almost twice what anybody else's labor rates were, so we just didn't really consider them. The others were all very close, but we came down to recommending that we use Eastridge Fast Loop for our oil changes and tires, and they've been doing that for a long time anyway, and then going with Eastridge Auto Electric to do our repair work. Thank you, sir. And that's for a citywide, remember we talked about, well, not just the lease. Are we going to be priority in this? Yes, that was part of the proposal. Because I've seen some of our cars set up today. I have not yet to tell you I like the fleet, but I have seen some of our cars set up our report. That was part of, the top of the part of the proposal and in the contract that will be uh, implemented. Thank you. Uh, I'll entertain a motion for resolution 2956. Make a motion to approve resolution 2956. Do that second. Second. We have a motion from Vice Mayor Dalton and a second from uh, Council Member Quinn to approve resolution 2956. Do we have any other discussion? Roll call, please. Vice Mayor Helton? Yes. Council Member Cagle? Yes. Council Member Chauncey? Yes. Council Member Witt? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. Item L, Resolution 2957. This is appointment of the Beer Board. Yeah. Resolution for uh, 2957, appointment to the Beer Board for Council Member Kate. Yes, sir. I would uh, like to nominate Mr. Ross Calvin. He's standing back here. Right now, Craig, she works with the Carlisle Hospital and the Children's Department, so he can make us good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so I will, I think, as in the past, we actually uh, approve this by majority vote. Right, it just allows more of a, it's, it's more of an acknowledgement that right. Councilman Cagle has nominated, and we do this because it allows for um, to Miss Middleton for indexing purposes. So the vote here is just really just you're for acknowledging the acknowledging. nomination by Councilman Cagle. All right. Have a motion for acknowledgement. Make a motion to approve 2957. I'll second. We have a motion to approve by Vice Mayor Hilton and a second by Council Member Chauncey. Any discussion? Roll call, Ms. Hilton. Vice Mayor Hilton? Yes. Council Member Cagle? Yes. Council Member Chauncey? Yes. Council Member Witt? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. Thank you. Okay, item J, appeal of the Housing Commission decision for the demolition of 1700 Green Moore Road. This is just, people may not know this, so the, the city has adopted under Title 13 a Housing Commission. The Housing Commission has the, the authority, uh, takes um, citations and, and, and notices from inspectors, the city, code enforcement um, department comes in. Once the Housing Commission is notified and the Housing Commission convenes a meeting and it hears the evidence at a Housing Commission meeting, both from the code inspector as well as property uh, owners and, and others in interest in the property. Uh, the standard by which it is um, reviewed is under uh, Chapter 3 of Title 13, uh, where it talks in there about um, standard defects that are, in, uh, that are enum enumerated with regard to all dwellings and that the um, dwelling shall be deemed unfit. Uh, for human habitation or dangerous buildings if they fall into certain categories and so we'll, we'll go through those in a little bit. The Housing Commission, um, my recollection heard this, Mr. Howell, June 10th. June 10th and rendered an opinion at that point 
and that opinion uh, found the property to be uninhabitable pursuant to Title 13 and ordered that the property um, be demolished under the city housing authority. It would be 30 days of an opportunity for the property owners to demolish the property. In the event that they don't demolish it, then the city is able to go and demolish it and then tax the cost and collect it in the form of a lien as it would any other lien or taxes on the property. <coughs> Additionally, property owners have the authority uh, to appeal, and those come under Title or Chapter 3, Section 13. And so, as it provides under the code, um, the property owners may appeal, and that in the event that there is a, uh, an appeal, it shall be heard as a matter de novo, which is just Latin for do over, you know, new. And so, the evidence you hear tonight, you know, there's no presumption of correctness with regard to the Housing Commission. This body will take a de novo review, a brand new review of it, and it will have the ability to make its own decision relative to the information that it hears and makes a consideration. To the extent that there is information being presented to this body, you have the right to challenge the authenticity. If there is submitted information, you have the right to ask questions as to where representatives that are being um, at least held up as supportive of one direction or another. and. Um, that this body has the ability to weigh, uh, to weigh all of that information and evidence. So with that, um, Mr. So, House. So yes, June the 10th, uh, the Housing Board uh, declared this uh, property be demolished. Uh, at that time, yeah, the, uh, they were given 30 days to, uh, to demolish the home. Uh, the owners want to extend that to 90 days so they can continue to clean out the property of the valuables. Thank you. Yeah, there's 70 years of collection. We own that property. My dad bought it in 1950. So there are a lot of stuff in that house. My sister, who has since passed away, she's loaded up the old garage, which the roof's falling in on. And yeah, we are planning on having that tore down. Uh, we have entered into a contract with Big Woody's Tree Service. Do once we get the stuff cleaned out. That they will start demolishing the house. But something came up today, and I spoke with Mike earlier. Uh, I have a friend that's in real estate. He's got a person that might be interested in purchasing the house. So we uh, even met with him today and went over the stuff and showed him the, the, the need and the layout of the property because there's almost three acres 2.81 acres totally involved, not just a Lot when the house sits on the four acres, but he's got four lots three on the north side, one on the south side, that are landlocked. And his only access is to the 1700 Primal Road. And we were talking about selling the whole thing. You wouldn't mind, can you go ahead and state both your names for the record? My name is Daryl McCurry. Paul McCurry. Thank you. So this just came up late yesterday evening and, and today, meeting with that real estate. He's got to get back with the man that's interested in it. So we've got two other things working at the same time. We're cleaning it out so it can be demolished under your code. And there's a possibility we may sell it during this 90 day period we're asking for. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask. So you're asking for 90 days instead of the 30. So that this negotiation with possible selling doesn't extend that past 90. You still no, will do no, it. If it happens, it will happen within the 90 days. Okay. Will then Mike or Charlie know how to sell it goes if it works? I'm, I'm, I'm fine and reasonable with 90 days. The owners still demolish the house. I don't know whether he'll demolish it or it will be a requirement in 90 days, correct? <laughs> right. It's still ordered to be demolished. So, I mean, that even if they, someone else purchases the home, that order is still in effect, I do believe. Well, it would be in effect. But this body, I mean, they feel that this body will need to make that determination. It's a brand new as if the housing commission order does not does not exist any longer, and so, so we can set that. You can you can modify your options are you can modify, reaffirm, or overturn the housing commission. And if you modify, in some instances you, you can overturn it. But um, so you can set that as. Um, but I think probably Mr. Ritchie, um, should there be something? I think that you all want in the record the basis for what the city's position is as to the rendering it uninhabitable. Um, so yes, this house was, um, it, it 
did have a house fire, um, appliance, appliance fire um, between that and weather decay. Um, just nobody living in the house. A house will die. Uh, how long? How long ago was the fire? Two uh, years. Two years ago. A little over two years. But if you're talking about being in, uh, unoccupied for two years, I can tell you, Deuce Plank here on Craigmore and another one on Lee Street. Have been over 40 years, nobody's lived in either one of those two duplex. They're just sitting there. It's in two years, it's no time. There's a house over there behind the Hickory Pit Barbecue on Oakdale that's been sitting there for 10 years. Their vines have taken it over. <coughs> nobody's lived in it. Why is this so, so short a time period from yeah. us? Let, let. This house is also in the 100 year flood zone. Um, By 10 proof. feet. Central improvement form that was sent to me um, hit over 100% of the value of the home, um, so the house would have to be raised one foot above the base flood. That's kind of where we're. They don't want to raise it, and that's where it got voted to be torn down. Okay, so not that we didn't want to raise it. I've got a question. Uh, this petition here that I'm reading it. This uh, Wells Fargo. No. Uh, believes the repairs or would not exceed the business value. Oh, it's got Cedar Command here. No, no. no. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. okay. I know property talks about. My apologies. Okay. The situation with this property, I think, I did and I don't know. We were on the deed with our sister. She was the executor of the, the estate, and she took control of the property and locked me and my brother physically out of the house until she died in 17. Her children, Johnny Wilhoy and Kate McCurry, were living in the house with Katie's boyfriend and, and a young son until they got ordered up at 18. We did not have control of the house until it was ordered up at 18. I have been working on it since then to get things cleared up and cleaned out and done as best I can with one person to help me, my 37-year-old disabled from our son. Yeah. And I'm working as best I can to get this done. They don't want to believe me at the housing commission. They said we didn't submit evidence and I did turn in. I had no elevation certificates. I showed them maps. I, I, I ran it off and stuff. They had asked for it. They said I didn't do it. And they, they stated that the house was a burnout. It was a small appliance fire. And the, the fire department took 20 minutes to get there. and. Did more damage did more to the fire, fire game to the house. They, did, they ripped out a four by eight section of plaster wall and cut a two by, uh, by eight foot oval in the ceiling to make sure there was no fire in the attic. But there was a full downstairs for the attic two feet away from But that's all besides the point. We've been trying to do this. I've even agreed to pay for having it torn down. I've entered a contract with, with this big Woody Street Service. It's also one of the listed as Watt, 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 Final that, but I think that that order needs to withstand even the selling of the property to someone else. It still needs to be demolished within the 90 day period. Well, if the if, 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 if they don't, if they don't want to rehab it, well, and, and meet if it they're code. willing to raise it and rehab it, exactly, they could still do that even under the that order to well, that's push. I think Mr. Ritchie was going to say something about. Can you explain to this body the substantial improvement form and, and the, the 50 percent basis or 40 percent basis and what the what you have been submitted um, by the property owners, what the uh, value of the property is for the taxes. That's yeah, so the building value of this is uh, $45,200. The estimate I got from McCurry was uh, $62,000. So I mean, that's well over 100% of the building value. And that's right. the purpose of the value estimates. Somebody listed back piece of property. The tax assessor's office is for asset. 
assessed value. It's not the true value unless he's got a, a license to uh, be an appraiser, then how can he verify those values? Because what you get from the tax assessor's office is an assessed value of the property, which is less than a third of the true value of the property. That's, they assess the property to base the tax structure on. That is not the true appraisal value of the house and the property that's on the tax records. You have to have a licensed appraiser to give you those values. So he's more than welcome to hire a licensed appraiser to do that if he doesn't believe that the uh, tax assessor is correct on this. The National Flood Insurance Program, this is what we have to go off, the building value versus substantial improvement of the building. If it hits 50%, the flood kicks in, the building's got to be raised. We're saying that, no problem if it was one of the That's not, not the issue. Just in time to get it cleaned out of this thing, big and, and get rid of what we got in the to cut, keep the cost down on the material. The more, the more stuff that's in the house, the higher the cost of material. That's basically I, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I'm, I'm trying not to speak for the council, but my opinion, I'm fine with giving you an extra time, giving you in the 90 days. I think what the question comes in is if you sell it, then what does the new property owner? Does this carry forward to them? Let's go back to the housing board, then. Th this body can, this make, body that can make that decision. Yeah. So, you know, well, I'm, I'm not willing to let the house sit there for any time past 90 days. The state of the house is unknowable and it's true. It is unknowable because my niece and nephews have dogs and cats in there and they made a total mess of the house. We've been cleaning it. And most of it cleaned out, there's still a lot to do yet. I've been to the attic of 70 years worth of stuff that's in the attic. I've cleared the most of that out. I've taken eight or ten loads to Goodwill. I've taken loads to the, to the dump site. Uh, and I've been getting a 350 truck. I've got a big, big truck truck load. Just a uh, hot lot. Still working on it. And uh, like I say, the adjoining lots on either side of 1700 Creekmore are on the back portions of the lots there. And your landlock, as far as the driver, does not go through the back. So that when we landlock, we can lose 700 free more, so we'll sell it, we'll sell it all together and as one big piece. But the four lots in home that I own here, three of which I own outright, the, the 1700 is drunk down right now with Daniel Brother. So you say the house is in Hamilton, and you agree. So if it is, and it's got to be raised because it's going to require more than the value. That it is currently. So, is the house even, if it's inhabitable, can it even be raised and, and rebuilt or added on to? Or is it, does it need to be a total demo regardless? I just put an uh, almost $9,000 roof on it last year. I said I didn't provide evidence that I could cancel the checks or whatever. Well, I could turn out some of my checking out by check number, pay to dates. All that of all the money I spent on the group and all the other money I spent on the contractor, uh, Brian Austin, I spent over sixteen thousand dollars on Brian to do the electrical and, and act as general contractor to get the other stuff done. And he got the last package for me on the fourth of January this year, and we were told that on the tenth of June that he maybe did. Found out, yeah, he died on the fifth of January. So getting my money back to him is now impossible too. That's another thirteen thousand he's out. So if you sell it, might be able to recoup your money that way. So you say it's unhabitable even to be right. Ready. So a house that was built in nineteen forty to meet the code requirements of two thousand eighteen are very difficult. It's best to tear it down and start over. Well, this house was built out of two by four inch two by four tweak gun lumber. Still soft as a rock, you can't drive a 20 penny nail in it. You have to drill and then put nails in. If we give you an additional 90 days and the property is sold within that time, would you agree to pay for the demolition or with the new owner? Because it has to be demolished. Well, if it's sold, then the new owner should come back to the housing commission, I think, and, uh, and get whoever. I don't know if you'll be able, they be able to do another appeal. Probably not. No, I mean, it's based upon the property. I mean, and, and the basis for that is what would constitute a sale. I mean, they can sell it to a, a, a cousin or something and try to render it as a, a 
sell, but in fact it's just another way to delay it. Um, so it's not about the sale, it's just the order sticks with the property Probably. regardless who owns it. Okay. Do we know if the people that are buying the house, do they want the house or do they just want the property? I was told by the real estate that met with us today, is the gentleman that's interested in the house is a licensed plumber that dabbles in construction and he's looking at flipping the house. So I don't know what his intention is if he purchases it, but it's nothing, it's just something that came up from a call from my friend that's a real estate agent last night and then text message with him today and he met with us to go over and see all the property because I informed him that we were going to sell it all and needed all the lots in the house. And so he was going to get back and I had not heard anything back from him as of yet today. But all this just came up. I had no idea what was going to happen. I don't know whether he's going to get us back in I have a question. He's the real, real estate agent that contacted me. This might have been answered. Do you have a mortgage on the property? No, no, no. But it's been paid for for years. Is, is there any, is there any municipal liens on the property? No. no. That, that you're aware of? Uh, no, they, uh, it was had a lien on it for being boarded up, but it's, it hasn't been paid. I paid that lien That's something else. We were never notified they were going to board it up. We just bought it out of and just board it up. You're, you're wanting 90 days to... Finish to, to, it out. To, okay. And, and, and that's it. You, Unless we sell it. And it, it, it looks like the house is roughly a thousand square feet, thirteen hundred. Uh, it's not very big. About so, uh, fourteen hundred square feet. And big woodies, even though they're a tree service, you're hiring them to do the clean out. Well, the little and everything else. Okay. The more we get cleaned out and removed and taken down, the less the cost of their demolition will be for us. And there's a lot of valuable stuff that we haven't gone through. Like I say there's 70 years of family collection in there. There's a 800 pound wood burning stove that's in perfect condition. We've got to figure out how to get out of it. He's 70 and I'm 68. It's nothing that we're going to have a problem doing it. It's going to take a while to do. But it's too bad we just like we it up. Mayor, I'll, Mayor, I'll say uh, I'd like to uh, uphold the, the decisions of the commission. Um, they don't have a sales contract here to present to us to, to prove that someone's going to buy the home. Uh, I think they've had ample time to, to get their belongings out of the home. Uh, I, I don't think 90 days. I think 90 days is just something to string it out a little further. Maybe. No, it's uh, it's honest fact. So we're willing to clean it out. We I know you might think we have intentions to clean it out, but I mean, I. I He's got a handicap. 60 days. He has to take care of. So she's days. been bedridden for four years. She's got a retarded son. I've got four things wrong with me that, that are putting a physical limitation on me. I've got a wife that's had a stroke. I've got a 49-year-old stepson that can't, that's got Tourette syndrome. I'm having to take care of him, get no help from anybody for but me. So it's hard for me to go over to help him. All I got going on, I can show you a picture of my duplex that in the last month is split between the two of them. The, the one's half is sinking so bad it's separating them. The front side of it split up in the last month that I've got to take care of my own property and I can't do it. So I, the 90 days is just so we can finish going through what's in the house, getting rid of the junk, saving the value, and then cleaning out the garage, which we need to start with that we know has got to come down because the roof is like this thanks to my sister. But the entrance lab, you know, I mean, us have anything to do with it. Well, one last question now. Can you tell me how much time that they've had up until tonight? 60 days since we got notified. We've had a whole whopping 60 days. Two months. With his wife in bed for four years, me and my wife's problems physically, and we've got our own problems we have to take care of. We have to work in when we can. That's why we're asking for 90 days so we can have more time to get over there and clean it out. That's it. I'm in favor of giving the 90 days. I am too. I am as well, but I, I would say within 90 days, regardless if it sells yes. or not, it has to be demolished in 90 days. Well, like I say, he's under contract. Right, I understand. No. Councilman Cagle, you had something? How did the real estate guy talk to you? I can't. 
see the paper provided or he's still up in there? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kelly. No one's talked to me about that. I think he just made a motion towards me, but yeah, it wasn't me, Mr. Kelly. Okay. I talked to Mike this evening between the meetings and informed you because I just found out <coughs> late yesterday afternoon from Dennis Massingill that he had somebody who might be interested and we met with Dennis this afternoon. He made copies of the deed and flat map and some other stuff and we walked him around and showed him the whole property and so he's supposed to be getting back with the guy that asked him about it. So we, this the sale thing just come up today, basically. I just met with Dennis physically today about the sale. So I don't know where that's going to go, if it's even going to go. But the 90 days was, we requested the 90 days for the clean out before the sale they can come up. So I don't know what the sales will have any kind of effect on it or not. We still got to get the stuff out here regardless whether the sales or not. Right. And that's what we're asking for the 90 days. And why? Right. That was the, uh, what you just said there about giving it the 90 days. But I also like to have Mr. Woody up here tomorrow getting all of his permits to demo, demo it to be sure that we've got good faith in you all having it because he's going to put his money up to get the permits. And, and I mean, all the permits because it's probably has best to see it. But he said the asbestos is not a problem on the residential. Okay. Right. And, that, and that's true through the Hamilton County Air Pollution Quality Control. Yeah, but I'm saying, let's get Mr. Woody up here and get the, all the permits we need. If there we've got good faith that's going to be torn out. He's not going to invest his money if he don't have a contract with him to tear it down. I have emailed him to proceed with the contract to demolish. He's waiting on the outcome of this meeting tonight. That's what I'm saying. Give you the 90 day he comes in tomorrow and gets his demos, permits. Give you the 90 days of the night and he's in here tomorrow and gets the demos. If he's not, next council meeting, well, then we'll take the 90 days back. Uh, depends on whether his business schedule is even time to come out of all. Well, I think Council McHale's asking just for the commitment from, right. from Big Wood. He's not yeah, out there actually starting to tear it down. Correct. Yes. Did I read that right? Did I, did I understand you right? Okay. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, if the sale involved that the guy does want to flip it, and we say tonight that it has to be tore down, that might lose their sale? Well, I mean, the, the, I'm going, the person that buys it could, could it depends. they're willing to put what, what, that money into it? Well, it actually depends. Once you start tearing into a building built in the 1940s, you want to run into some problems. I'm so just one, one thing, uh, Council Member, uh, under 13-307, the code provides that in any case where a dwelling is unfit for human habitation or dangerous building and is 50% damaged or decayed, it shall be demolished. So yeah, under the code, the 50%, 50 at the 50%, yeah. in other words, if the cost to repair it is at least 50% of the value of the house under the city code, it has to be demolished, regardless of who owns it. I mean, the structure still stays the same as what the code is being written as, and if I understand Mr. Ritchie, it's got a $62,000 renovation on a private piece of property that they're required to go by the tax assessor. It has a value of 45 to 45 So Is that the value or is that the assessed value? That's the appraised value, right? The appraised, not assessed. The appraised value for that. That's what the building, not all the land. Right, the build structure. Build you build can build. only do the building. Well, that's what I'm saying. The building, where did you get the 45000 from? If that's off the tax records, that's the assessed value of the tax. Well, the assessed value would be 25% of that. Of the value. Right. So the assessed would be around 15000 and he's not saying that. He's saying 18450 18000 is the assessed. So you have that. 45000 is the appraised. But who appraised it? I understand under their substantial completion, their their instructions don't go by the tax assessor. Is that right? So they go by the tax assessor. They don't know dot com for one hundred and three thousand, and we never authorize anybody to sell it. That's with the land. There's two parts to the assessment: you know, land and you have the building. That's right. So he's referring to just the building part of the assessment. So. so I don't know if that answers the question, but it's just under the code. If it's 50% value, if it hits, it, it's to be demolished. Now, I just don't want to lose a sale. 
because we're saying that he has to demolish it if the guy's buying it because he he wants to. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and that's alternatively, the value of the land may be worth more if it's demolished. In which well, case, he may want to buy it and demolish it. We just don't know that. He's not here tonight. I, I never even I don't even know what the gentleman's name that's interested in buying. I just was told that he was a plumber by profession, but he also does general contract work. That's all I know about the man that might be interested in. Well, nothing would prohibit this body from entering a stay on its own order. And you could say it will be torn down in 90 days, regardless of who owns it. And if this gentleman comes in and has a serious plan to raise it and do that, this, this body does have the authority to stay its order okay. and, and can reserve that right. You raise in plans and Presents it to yeah, them. I mean, if I understand it to Richie, they have to come in with a substantial proof plan, but it's... I just didn't want to lose a sale if, if there's something. If, and if they can come back and bring something, then we can change it. We can do the same. You could do If you do sell it. Right, but I think my understanding for the code enforcement, it's got to be something more than just, a, hey, I intend to fix this thing. They've got to come in with plans, you know, permits pulled, and, and, or at least attempt to be pulled, and demonstrate immediate preparation <coughs> which are going to be taken, not a, he needs an additional. And I'm for putting that in our. Well, when you put that in the actual motion, that's just a, a, a procedural thing that could occur. Is that correct? Yeah, you always can reserve that. Okay. All right. Do we have a motion on the floor? Maximum is to be demolished within 90 days. Not more than. Not more than 90 days. Okay. Do you have a second? Second. All right. We have a motion from Vice Mayor Hilton, and a second from Councilmember Cagle, to uphold the demolition within not more than 90 days. So that doesn't foreclose them from being able to sell. Correct. And that gentleman has all, can at least and if that to owner wants to present plans and attempt to try to come in, and, and this body can then make a determination if it wants to. It doesn't have to retake that issue. It may say we're not taking up the issue. Um, you have that right. So if you want to reconsider, put a stay on your own order. Any other discussion? Roll call, Ms. Milton. Uh, Mayor Helton? Yes. Councilmember Cagle? Yes. Councilmember Chauncey? Now, I fully support the decisions of the Housing Commission. I don't mean to sound incompassionate. I think we've had a lot of time. I think 90 days is too long. I'd be more in favor of 60. So with that, I'm saying no. Councilmember Witt? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. yes. You have 90 days. One thing we've got to do, just yeah, to memorialize this in, in a manner that Mr. Lyle with Middleton, uh, you know, that you, um, what I propose is, is that you all just, let's do a resolution to reflect um, the order. And so in other words, you've got an order that they've prepared, and uh, it would be resolution number 2958. Um, you probably want to move to approve the resolution memorializing the order and incorporating it. I make a, a motion to memorialize resolution 958. Incorporate. I would have a motion from uh, Vice Mayor Helton and a second from Councilmember Cagle uh, to memorialize the resolution 2958. Do we have any other discussion? Roll call, Ms. Miller. Vice Mayor Helton. Yes. Councilmember Cagle? Yes. Councilmember Chauncey? No. Councilmember Witt? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. I believe that concludes our agenda tonight. Thank you all for staying and meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening.